meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Jim Westwood, the president of the City Club. As is our usual habit, we'll begin with uh, welcoming and introducing our new members. And we have four new members seated at uh, the table in front of me this, this afternoon. I'd like to introduce uh, them one by one, ask them to stand, and please hold your applause until I've completed the introductions. First, Steve Buckstein, president of the Cascade Policy Institute. Amy Ott, a tax accountant with Ernst & Young. Kevin Renner, Planning and Marketing Associate, Legacy Health System. And Jonathan Ross lists his uh, occupation as freelance advocate. I wonder, are you an attorney? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Welcome to City Club. Next Friday, July 5th, of course, being the 4th of July weekend, is one of those rare Fridays that City Club does not have a regular meeting. So have a happy 4th of July, and we'll see you in two weeks. And that will be Friday, July 12th, at which time the award-winning Ave Sol Latvian Choir will be our special guests. This is a 36-member chamber choir, which has taken honors at numerous international competitions and has received worldwide recognition. Their home, of course, is one of the Soviet Baltic republics. And it has gained attention for the fervent attempts to win independence for, from Soviet control over the last two or three years. The choir's appearance is timely. It will appear in regional costume, we're told, and uh, the members will sing folk and other songs which reflect the rich Latvian tradition. A translator will be available for those few of you who don't speak Latvian for the question and answer period. Please note, for the program on July 12th, we will be returning to the Benson Hotel Mayfair Room. Our board host today, seated at the head table, is Kathy Oxborough, a member of the Board of Governors and a communications consultant. She will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speakers, and the second question from the microphone at the floor will be asked by Lorraine Robertson, a member of the City Club's Law and Public Safety Standing Committee. Following the second question, as always, we will open up the question, open up the meeting to questions from City Club members, I emphasize City Club members only, in the audience after our prepared remarks from the speakers. Written questions will be asked as time permits. There are forms for written questions on your tables. Please hold them up after the speakers are finished so that staff can gather those questions and bring them to the head table. Well, the debate rages on, and I do mean rages, over gun control legislation and its potential for reducing crime on the one hand, but possibly eroding civil liberties on the other. The French writer Anatole France uh, said about a hundred years ago that the law in its majestic equality prohibits beggars and rich men alike from sleeping under bridges. So too, perhaps it can be said that strict gun control keeps firearms out of the hands of criminals and potential killers, but also takes much defense away from their potential victims. But when police have to carry guns with the devastating killing power that we've witnessed lately in order to have a fighting chance against youth gangs and other criminals who are wielding the same or better arms, can we citizens who may be trapped in the crossfire feel much safer? Yet on the other hand, when our founding fathers had hammered out the precious rights embodied in the First Amendment of speech, press, and religion, they turned immediately to the Second Amendment and established an uninfringible right to keep and bear arms. Yet on the other hand, the reason given in the Second Amendment was the need to support 18th century style militias in a day with, when farmers with muskets could fight army regulars on equal terms. So the debate goes on and on. Our two speakers are here today not to debate gun control, but rather to give us two separate views in support of the idea. So admittedly, we are not presenting a balanced program today. I think we will hear a lot of good information, though, and I trust that the question period at the end will bring out any uh, areas of, of question that members may have. Tom Potter, Portland's chief of police, is a native Portlander, a graduate of Cleveland High School and the University of Portland, never straying far from the tree, who worked his way through the ranks of the Portland Police Bureau for 20 years. Last November, Mayor Clark appointed him chief of the Portland Police Bureau, and in the few months since then, he has made his mark through his advocacy of, among other things, community policing, and now, against some stiff opposition from some of, some of his colleagues, as an advocate of gun control as well. Dana Schaefer, 
a longtime Oregonian, and I was pleasantly surprised to discover as I was reading her biography, an award-winning playwright and teacher has been a vocal advocate for gun control since her daughter Rebecca was senselessly killed by a gunman in Los Angeles two years ago. She has since founded Oregonians Against Gun Violence, which now has over 500 members, and has lobbied from the local to the national level in support of gun control legislation. Our two speakers should have some real food for thought for us this afternoon, and I'll introduce first Dana Schaefer. Hi, thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I really admire the City Club and value this forum. I'm also happy to be here with Chief Tom Potter, who I think is one of the best things to happen to Portland in a long, long time. I know a lot of people agree with me on that. <laughs> uh, I know you'll be happy to hear that due to time constraints, I had to throw out most of what I was going to say. <laughs> The first thing that had to go was the opening joke. So I, I will try to take comfort from what my mother told me, which was, oh honey, don't worry, they'll laugh no matter what you say. <laughs> That's mom, always supportive, I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm here today, my, my task is to share with you my, my citizen's eye view of gun control in Oregon. and. I'm an ex-English teacher, and like, like a good English teacher, I'm going to share my thesis statement with you first. It's, I used to tell my students, give the reader a sporting chance, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them. Um, my view is that, that Oregon is undergoing a, a seismic change with regard to gun control, and that this is a very exciting time to be involved in it, because things are changing, both in terms of public opinion and mobilized public opinion in terms of visibility of law enforcement on the issue and in terms of politics and legislative action. To t share my view with you, I need to start with how I got involved. Uh, I'd been, I'd always thought it was terribly important and never did anything about it, of course, like a lot of us do with a lot of issues. And it was, on July 18, 1989, that I got a phone call from a total stranger saying, telling me that, that our daughter, Rebecca, uh, had been murdered by, she was an actress and she'd been murdered by somebody. Uh, this never gets easy to say, and you know, the, the more I talk about it, the more I am aware that there are always other people listening who also have gone through something like this. And I'm not just talking about gun-related violence, I'm talking about people with, whose families have also suffered some kind of anguish. And I, I will only say, I don't know who you are, but I know you're here. Anyway, um, to, p to pull it out of the personal for a second, I, I was very quickly labeled a gun control advocate. And, and it's because that was a Tuesday that we got the call. And on Friday, Benson and I, my husband and I, were interviewed by a guy from the Oregonian, a young reporter named Dave Austin. And in this interview, I expressed my rage at a system which delivers a lethal weapon into the hands of a deranged person. A deranged person, in my lexicon, describes anybody who murders, by the way. And this story was published and went out over the wires, and that single remark of mine was was seized upon and remarked upon and editorialized upon. And so willy-nilly, I came away from Los Angeles back to Oregon with this label affixed of, of gun control advocate. So that's what'll get you when you, you say what you think, so watch out, okay? Um, and and I'm, I'm impressed at, at how how ready people were to seize on that one remark in that whole entire article, and it tells me that people are looking for, for public advocates for this, for this very important issue. Uh, and maybe they're looking for a mouth, and maybe I qualified, I hope so. Uh, let me fast forward to December of 1989. I received a call, that was, that was, that was July. In, in December of 1989, I received a call from the office of Commissioner Rick Bauman and was told 
that uh, County Commissioner Rick Bellman and Pauline Anderson were introducing uh, an ordinance regulating assault weapons in public places, and would I come and testify for it? And I said, sure. And I put on a jacket to indicate seriousness of purpose. And <laughs> I, I picked up a lot of tricks that I'll share with you. Uh, <laughs> I um, went down there, and, and I'd been warned, actually, that there would be a hostile crowd. And I don't know why that, that didn't sink into me, but I, anyway, I went down there and stood at a podium like this in front of the commissioners who were ringed in a semicircle in front of me with 300 very, very ardent pro-gun people in back of me. And um, I, a wonderful thing happened, and that is that as I spoke, and I, and I don't know at what point it was, but I think it was, I, I actually think it was when I mentioned Rebecca's name, I heard a chorus of boos and hisses arise behind me. And in my innocence, I did not know they were booing at me. I can't account for it. And I remember stopping and thinking, gosh, I wonder who they're booing. Trust me, that I, I, anyway, it was wonderful because when I got home, I discovered that in fact they had been booing me. And I don't mean to suggest that all people who are, who are pro-gun or, or members of the gun community are like those people. They're not. We can't, th there's, there's a range on both sides of the issue, absolutely. But, but those particular people did that, and what it did was, again, galvanize a lot of, a lot of public opinion. And a lot of people called into the commissioner's offices and said, uh, this is outrageous. I really am not going to stand for this anymore. So the, now, now let me tell you a little bit about how Oregonians Against Gun Violence got born. The, the, the hearings continued on concerning this, this really very modest, very modest ordinance. And some of us kept seeing each other, and faces became familiar, and, and we made phone calls, and, and were in touch. And somewhere along the line, we decided, a group of us decided that we, we wanted to get together. And, and, and I think that this is good fodder for a student of sociology. At what point do like-minded people decide they're going to be a group? Um, I'm sure it's probably been done a million times, too. But in February of 1990, um, three people, Julie Sterling, Nan Whitaker Emmerich, and I convened a meeting of people who were interested in gun control. And these included people who'd, who had chosen to testify at the Multnomah County hearings, uh, people who had called in in outrage over, over this little brouhaha, and uh, a group of people who Julie Sterling knew would be interested in the issue. And so there were about 30 people there that first night. And that really was the germ of Oregonians Against Gun Violence. It's, um, we, we, we grew rapidly in a year. We went from zero to 500 members with a large advisory board of, of committed community leaders and a very vigorous and energetic executive board. And I'd like to suggest that that, that, that rapid growth, w w I'd like to talk about two reasons for that. One is simply that's, that's an indication of, of how strong public opinion is in Oregon. People are ready to do this now. And I also would like to take a minute to talk about the wonderful diversity of talent and personality that has assembled itself in Oregonians of, against gun violence. Um, and I'd like to mention three names. And in so doing, I'm going to embarrass them, and I'm going to slight the 497 other committed Oregonians against gun violence. And the three names I'm going to mention are first Nan Whitaker Emmerich, who is my co-chair, and who really, it was her idea to convene that first meeting. She's a drug and alcohol counselor and is very good at, at facilitating our meetings, keeping us cohesive, keeping us going, and she's done a lot for membership. I need to mention also Maureen Leonard, uh, an attorney who's on our executive board, who is uh, who possesses not only a razor sharp legal mind, but also has two qualities that I heard an NBA coach say you need to win a ball game, and those qualities are hustle and scrap. And I really admire those qualities, and it is my hope that I have learned about something about scrap from Maureen. She also is a very good writer and has written a lot of briefs and, and knows how to draft legislation as well. The third person I need to mention is Tuck Wilson, and I'm sure that 
many, many of you here know who Tuck Wilson is. For those of you who don't, I will say simply that he's an attorney, he's on our executive board, that's parenthetical, and he's an asset to the state of Oregon. Um, in, in terms of gun control, he's, he's of incalculable value to the movement because 15 years ago he started a group called Oregon Handgun Alert, which was short-lived because, as I'm sure Tuck would agree, he was ahead of his time. That is, he was ahead of us. That is, he woke up to the urgency of the issue before the rest of us did. So that he brings with him a perspective of, of where we're coming from. He, he truly has seen, because he had his eyes open, he's, he's seen the changes that have happened. And he thus has a larger context and is firmly faced to the future. And I think it's fair to say that he has been and is our, our, our rudder. So those, maybe not, you'll know a little bit more about who we are and, and how we work, and maybe you'll see where, where you fit in, too. I, I want to tell you two more things. Briefly tell you what OAGV has done and what we hope to do. And I'd like to tell you my, some evidence for this, this, this big change in, in Oregon thinking about, about gun control. Um, well, let me start with it. We had a pr kickoff press conference in May of, of 90, and we spent most of 1990 really galvanizing public opinion and getting ourselves settled. We met with local officials. We lobbied the, the Oregon delegates in, in, in Washington, and we um, held a press conference calling on Ron Wyden and Lesa Coyne to vote yes on Brady. This was last year before it was squashed last year. And here's another tip for you, which I've learned. Lobby everybody. That way, whoever comes over to your side, you get to take credit for. <laughs> it's great. In, in fact, when, when Ronald Reagan um, came out in favor of the Brady Bill, people called me to congratulate me. <laughs> I loved it. I said, hey, anytime you want me to deliver a big name, just let me know. You know? No problem whatsoever. So uh, we were. And of course, we were very happy when, when Les did embrace gun control. And the last thing we did in 1990 was really to draft a comprehensive gun control bill, which we intended to take to Salem. So now, in 1991, that's where our focus has been in Salem. We uh, concentrated on getting sponsored, introduced, and heard our bill, and also defending against the gun lobby's attempt to continue to preempt local jurisdictions from, from passing gun control laws. And with the energy we had left over, we, uh, we, we lobbied the Oregon delegation in, in Washington on Brady, and we're, we were very happy with the, the handy win in the House. And I understand that uh, it is, the Brady bill has passed its, its first hurdle in the Senate, which is a very tight race, by the way. I mean, it's really tight. OK, here comes the end. Um, <coughs> The, the reason the reason that that Oregon is there there are three fronts on which uh, gun control is changing in Oregon. One is private citizens are are finally realizing that is that it is an issue of public safety. Law enforcement is becoming more and more visible and vocal on the issue. And legislators are finally doing something about it in a way they never have before. Let me give you four pieces of evidence as to that last realm. What, what has really happened politically that's different? First of all, remember that Oregon has been like, like the South and civil rights. And that's Tuck's analogy, by the way. So too, there's been a taboo against gun control in, in the West in, in Oregon. It's really been a regional taboo. The first. The first piece of evidence that something big was happening was the 1989 bill, the Katz bill, which, though dearly won, was a, s a landmark piece of legislation because it, it addressed the very important issue of handguns and established a 15-day waiting period and background check and really put Oregon on the map. We were, we were thereafter known for, for having a progressive gun control policy in the state, which was already a, a giant step. Second piece of evidence is that in May of 1990, sorry, I've skipped a very important thing, and that is the Multnomah County Ordinance. Um, 
this was a very modest ordinance in itself, but it provoked, as you remember, uh, a, a huge outcry and also provoked a recall effort against Commissioner Rick Bauman. The fact that he beat the recall is of huge significance in a state that had been traditionally anti-gun control. It's just a, a really huge victory and, and very important. Um, also, another huge victory really was the historic yes votes of Senators Hatfield and Packwood on, on the Deacon Senior Amendment last spring. Uh, again, remembering that the Oregon delegation had typically voted no on all gun control, so those were a huge step forward. And then, of course, uh, Les O'Coin's em embrace embracing of gun control and his and Ron Wyden's yes vote on Brady were both also hugely significant. That's my evidence that things are changing. I think we're a very we're in a very exciting time and I think that it's it's so great that now citizens can can be together and work on this hand in hand with law enforcement so that we can uh, see the kind of attitudes about firearms prevail that we want to see and get some legislation on the books that will protect our children and keep our neighborhoods the kind of places where keep and in some places restore our neighborhoods to the kind of places where our children can live in peace and safety together we can make a difference thank you thank you Dana well, from the citizens' viewpoint on gun control, we move now to the issue of gun control as crime control, and the very best source we could have for information and insight on that, I think we'd all agree, is Chief Tom Potter. As uh, Dana, and you know, sometimes I feel like it's sort of the Dana and Tom show because I seem to follow her at a lot of meetings. But as Dana was mentioning the fact that sometimes how something is said and, and it's, you're, you're sort of put in a particular role, I wasn't as fortunate uh, on such an important issue as gun control. Mine was jaywalking. <laughs> <laughs> and I just know when I retire from the Portland Police Bureau that I'm going to be known as the jaywalking chief, but we all have our crosses to bear. I would like to tell you what tomorrow's headline in the Oregonian is. It's a what-if headline. It's not going to be there, actually. But think of what, how you would react to it if it was. The headline reads, City of Salem Wiped Out. The narrative of the text said, Today, 100,000 Salem citizens died as a result of a mass massive earthquake estimated to be 8.6 on the Richter scale. The mayor who was in Los Angeles attending the National Mayor's Conference. <laughs> okay, I turned it around a little bit. <laughs> Upon hearing the news, was rushed to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital with chest pains. A spokesperson said the mayor was in shock and was placed on life support systems. Of course it didn't happen. Well, Actually, it did happen, but it wasn't Salem, and it wasn't today or tomorrow. Actually, it's been occurring over the last 10 years all over the United States. 101,828 people were killed with firearms in the United States of America, just about the population of Salem, Oregon. But if you give these facts, on gun deaths, it begins to give it a different twist. You begin to think of it not just as another statistic, but something that you can relate to. During that same decade, this last 10 years, there were 801 police officers in the United States killed in the line of duty. 92% of those police officers were killed with firearms. Death by firearms is the second leading cause of death amongst adolescents. Death by firearms is the leading cause of death 
among young black men in America. The National School Safety Center has estimated that during 1987, 135,000 youths attended school daily armed. The June 1990 Journal of the American Medical Association states that the homicide, homicide rate in the United States is four times greater than the next country, Scotland. Well, gosh, what does this mean? Do we have a lot of guns here in America? Well, it depends upon what you mean by a lot. In the last 10 years, the United States has produced an estimated 44 million firearms, including 20 million handguns. That's in addition to the estimated 100 million handguns already in circulation. In all, America has over 200 million privately owned firearms, which means that we have one for almost every man, woman, child, and infant in the United States. Locally, in the last five years, the Portland Police Bureau has seized over 8,000 firearms. We've responded to 93 homicides committed with firearms. On March 25th of this year, a young man was playing with a handgun in his home. He was admonished by his family to stop playing with it and they hid the gun. It was a 357 Magnum. The young man found the gun and later that evening was showing it to some girls to impress them. As a means to impress them, he pointed the gun out a window and fired a shot. The bullet traveled, traveled across the yard through the glass front window of another home and entered five-year-old Charlie Johnson's head, killing him. You know, that's the problem with statistics, is that they're just numbers. The problem with the 93 people killed in Portland, Oregon, is that they are people. What can we do about the death and destruction brought on by firearms? Can we actually control this proliferation of guns in our country? The answer has to be yes. I feel we have no choice. We have to start now. What can you do? You can support legislative efforts that limit the manufacture of non-sporting guns. You can support legislative efforts to ban further manufacture and importing of assault type weapons. You can support legislative efforts to limit the access to handguns. You can also treat this as a major public health issue, which it is, and give it the same kind of urgency that we give to any other dreaded disease in our community. I wanted to emphasize that there are things that we can do, but you know, unfortunately, the gun control issue, as has been stated, is a highly emotional issue. And that the effective use of language to move and inspire resources is also an important strategy. The term gun control does not convey the universality of the impact of firearms. In no small part, because of the NRA, the term immediately conjures up two opposing forces having little to do with the nation's health. Those who are fighting for constitutional rights and the right to defend oneself and loved ones, and those who are fighting to take those rights away. Yet I feel we need another way to reframe the issue so as to balance out the one million deaths in the last 50 years caused by American citizens shooting other American citizens. Perhaps the more fundamental question is the issue of violence in America. Guns are the conduit for expressing the American propensity for violence. We must address these issues head on and begin reducing violence 
and reduce the number of weapons, particularly handguns, used to carry out that expression. Several days after Charlie Johnson's death, a candlelight vigil was held near his home in Northeast Portland. Many people decried the violence and asked the question, when will the violence end? My question to you today is not whether you support gun control, but rather the same question asked of me at the vigil, when will the violence end? Thank you. Thank you, Chief Potter, and thank you, Dana Schaefer. Comes now the time for questions, and the first question to be asked will be by board host Kathy Oxborough. My question is concerning the Brady Bill, and I recently, President Reagan and Congressman Lessa Coyne, as Dana talked about, have switched their positions and are supporting the Brady Bill. Law enforcement officials, some of them are also supporting it. And my question is, why now? What are the factors out there that uh, are, are causing such significant changes in positions? It's been 10 years since uh, President Reagan was shot. The Brady Bill's been around for several years. What's happening now? It's for both of you. Uh, I think the tide of violence is rising. I think that's I, I think that's the biggest reason, that as more and more violence occurs and it gets closer and closer to more of us, more and more people are outraged and I think are, w are less and less willing to put up with the stranglehold the National Rifle Association has had on national politics. I think both of those things have happened. Yeah, I also believe that um, the tide of violence is rising, but I think the tolerance level is decreasing for violence in America. At least that's my hope. Um, we have to deal with violence uh, within the Portland Police Bureau and with any police agency. Um, you may think it ironic that uh, a supporter of gun control is standing up before you with a uniform and a gun on. Unfortunately, in society, um, we are the ones that are called upon to deal with this rising tide of violence. And quite frankly, the police around the United States are tired of it. We're tired of having to go to people's homes and find the bodies and call the relatives like they did with Dana. And we feel it's time for a change. And um, it's not just the Portland Police Bureau. Uh, when Representative Lessa Coyne held his press conference to announce his um, support of the Brady Bill, uh, the room was packed with police chiefs, sheriffs, and police officials. So there's a very strong support. Every major police organization in the United States supports the Brady Bill. So that's some of my reasons. As we go to questions from the floor, I'll remind you that uh, the privilege of asking questions is reser reserved for City Club members only, uh, although certainly statements that indicate your position on a uh, matter are uh, welcome as a preface, a short preface to a question. Uh, we would ask that questions end with a question mark uh, before too long. <laughs> <laughs> but our second question is from Lorraine Robertson, member of the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee, who already knew all those rules anyway. Yes. Uh, this is directed at you, Chief Potter. How effective has the relatively new Oregon law that requires a 15-day waiting period to purchase a handgun been? Is it too early, and if it has been effective, in what ways? Uh, I still think it's probably too early generally, but from what I hear from the state police who tabulate the figures is that uh, there have been several hundred cases where they have prevented firearms from falling into the hands of either uh, ex-cons or emotionally disturbed people. So I'm very heartened by the early uh, figures. Thank you. Yes, nice Ted Kay, member. Uh, although I personally decry all of the violence and problems that that guns. Uh, uh, impose on our society, I have to ponder with 200 million firearms out there, what kind of control will we really need before make any difference? I mean, I've heard the phrase, when guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. When I think of 200 million firearms out there, they can't get them legally, how are they, you know, aren't they going to be able to get them? And are we just looking at drops in the bucket here in control? Question for both of you. 
You know, I don't think we are looking at drops in the bucket. I think, for example, the Brady Bill, I appreciate the question, by the way. That's a good question. Uh, the Brady Bill does real work, especially now that it's, it's been amended by Senate Majority Leader Mitchell to, to require a background check as, as, as well as a, a seven-day wait. And it also, as you know, mandates money to states to upgrade criminal history files. Uh, and l laws like the Brady Bill will remedy the fact that half the states in this union have no background check whatsoever and no waiting period whatsoever. So right away, that would be, that would be changed. And it would also help to slow the, the, the very uh, vigorous movement of guns from states that have weak gun control laws into states that have strong gun control laws. And furthermore, a seven-day wait really does serve as, a, as a, a waiting period, a cooling off period. So that's one kind of legislation I would hope that we could make a difference with looking at some serious restrictions, as, as Chief Potter said, uh, on assault weapons on, and weapons of war in, in, in civilian hands. And I think we do need to address the issue of non-dealer sales, particularly high volume public places like swap meets and, and gun shows. And, and that's a, a very big area that needs addressing. And, and let me say that um, in Salem this year, as I was somebody said lugging. Every time I turned around, I saw Dana lugging around that bill as I was taking it around Salem, that of the provisions in there, that provision addressing non-dealer sales uh, provoked the, the, the widest positive response. And uh, so I think, yeah, we can, we can really make a difference. I would like to respond is that I, I believe these bills are extremely important. <laughs> But they're the sort of the political response to the problem. I think there's a couple of other areas we have to look at. One is the economic response. It's that there are people that profit from the sale of, of guns. Uh, the fact that we can manufacture 44 million over a 10-year period means that someone's making a bundle of money. Um, but there's also a tremendous cost involved. And we do have to figure out ways to share that cost with people who profit by the sale and distribution of firearms. The other area, and it's the one I think we should take up from Mothers Against Drunk Driving, is in the social arena, is that we've got to begin to change social attitudes and levels of tolerance towards violence. And that's a long-term effort. But when you realize that MAD began 20 years ago and they were considered the goofy people and that uh, everybody uh, wanted to stay away from them, but eventually they began to change the laws. Eventually they began to change some of the economic consequences of driving and drinking. And ultimately they changed the social conditions that found driving and drinking were no longer acceptable as they once used to be. We have to approach it on many broad fronts. I, I want to say I, I heartily endorse that, and that was one of the first things that, that Chief Potter said to us when we first met with him last year. He said, don't forget about education, it's crucial because, as he says, it's, it's changing attitudes that's, that's half the battle. Thanks. Next question. My name is Leslie Haldula, I'm a member. Could you address how effective handguns are, Chief Potter, in providing individual safety and in, in uh, safeguarding one's home? I read conflicting statistics on uh, having a handgun in your home as to how safe it is. Quite frankly, I'm not sure where the facts are. In Portland, um, stolen handguns from home is a source, a big source of, of handguns to the gangs in town. So just having it in there, whether it provides safety for you or not, is also one, one way for the gangs to obtain the guns. Uh, secondly, is a, a lot of people purchase handguns uh, they don't know how to use them, or they haven't made a decision in their mind that if things get really bad, will they use it? Um, we recently had a police officer come home to his residence and found a burglar inside. Now, this man is a trained police officer. He pulled his off-duty weapon out and confronted the man, and they wrestled for the gun for several minutes. And eventually, um, the man fled but I can imagine just the average citizen coming home and being confronted with that. Uh, it could be disastrous.
Can I also say that a study appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that a handgun in the home was 43 times more likely to be used against you or a member of your family than against an intruder, which is pretty scary. Seeing no questions immediately from the microphone, I have a written question that was handed up, and this is for Dana Schaefer. We understand that the bill that was introduced in the Oregon legislature uh, by Oregonians against gun violence has not passed and is not likely to pass this session. So the question is, what are your organization's plans for future legislation or activities? Thanks. Um, uh, Sine die is nearly upon us, so like a lot of bills, nothing's going to happen on, on SB 633. Uh, as I said, we, we learned a lot from working on this bill, so we have a much better idea of, of how we're going to go next time, and we, we'd like to hit Salem running in, in 1993, and I'm really not sure of exactly how we're going to approach it, but certainly we're going to address the issue of, as we did this time, of extending the waiting period to long guns, which, don't forget, according to the Oregon State Police study, are not only bought by hunters, long guns in fact more pe more disqualified people bought long guns or uh, it was a study more more disqualified people would have more disqualified people bought long guns than than tried to buy handguns which was a myth shattering statistic so we we'd like to do something about long guns and we certainly would like to do something about private sales and continue our fights against preemption do we have another question from the floor Hi, <coughs> Keith Kohlberg, member. This is a question for both of you. Uh, Chief Potter mentioned about when will the violence end, and you talked about societal attitudes. And a real big thing in my mind is television. I don't watch uh, commercial television very often, but whenever I do, it's you turn on, you see someone shot, and you flip the station, that sort of thing. And I was wondering, uh, do you uh, have any evidence that the level of violence on commercial TV relates to the level of violence in our society at all? I, I, I don't have names of articles to quote at my fingertips, but I, I certainly have heard that that's the case, and I think my husband, I've asked my husband who's a child psychologist, do kids, can kids be stimulated to violence and be stimulated to emulate violence on TV? And he says you can. And uh, in our own case, I, I guess I better not talk about it, but uh, there was some evidence that the guy who killed our daughter had been incited in some ways by stuff he'd seen on uh, in the movies. So that's certainly certainly part of the problem of why we're living in the most violent society on earth, yeah. <coughs> You know, I, uh, after uh, you see uh, uh, Daffy Duck get kicked in the butt so many times, uh, <laughs> it sort of loses, it makes it an unreal quality, but, but to me, the convincing evidence was watching my own children when they were little in front of the TV sets on Saturday morning, and they were carrying out and, and fantasizing some of the very same things they were watching on the Saturday morning cartoons. And so... I personally believe that there is a very direct correlation between what people observe and the kind of patterns and habits that develop as a result of those observations. Yes, next question. Steve Buckstein, a new member. Uh, question for Chief Potter, primarily. Uh, Chief, you made the comment a few, mo a few moments ago that there obviously is quite a bit of profit in guns because there were some 44 million manufactured in the last few years. Yes, my question is, from, from my understanding of history, prohibition, whether it's of alcohol or drugs or firearms or any commodity, simply raises the profit and puts the profit in the hands of criminals uh, who are, if anything, less responsible than those making the, the lower market profits now. And on the other hand, you talked about Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which I fully support in many of their efforts to increase the consequences of the misuse of alcohol, in their case, driving and alcohol. I'm wondering if you could address the other side of the equation, what's being done to increase the consequences of misusing firearms instead of emphasizing the instrument itself, emphasizing the responsibility of those who misuse it and how we can increase the consequences to people. You know, the, the issue isn't too much different from the drug issue. And there's supply and there's demand. 
And as long as you will have a demand, you'll always have a supply of whether it's drugs or guns. So I believe that uh, you can't have a very narrow single focus on whatever the problem is that you're attacking. It has to be broad-based. That's why I mentioned the economic, social, and political issues involved in handguns and, and guns in general. So my, my own um, feeling is, is that as long as people want them, there will be someone to supply them. But in terms of responsibility, I believe that the manufacturers of guns in America have pretty much got off scot-free. Yeah. And I believe it's time to introduce some responsibility, not only with them, but with everybody in our community. Each of us have to accept that responsibility that we either are part of the solution or we're part of the problem. And you know, in the crime package was just included a provision uh, making it a capital offense, making murder uh, with a gun taken across the state line a capital offense, so surely we are working on, on penalties. And I believe, and I'm going to take a leave from from um, Chief Potter, I, I learned two words from him last year, the words proactive and reactive. Uh, I think the penalties are important, I do, and I believe in them more strongly than ever, I can assure you. Uh, but why should we sit around and wait for people to commit crimes with guns? Let's try and keep them out of their hands in the first place. And I believe we can do that without, abs abs I, I know we can do that without infringing on the rights of honest, law-abiding citizens. Karen Katz, member. Uh, given that I have uh, limited contribution pennies, I have been a longtime member of National Gun Control. It, what, what is your advice as to where my contributions should go locally or nationally. Oh, <laughs> ow. I know I know that you know your personal preference, but where will it make the most difference? Where is it needed? Well, that's that's a good question. Uh, you know, that's 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 one for Solomon, boy. I Many I will say this, many Oregonians are members of both organizations. <laughs> <laughs> members <laughs> Penny's here. <laughs> Certainly, Handgun Control Incorporated has done a terrific job in Washington, and uh, I, I do believe that that local groups, that that eventually everything that happens at the national level is c rises. It, it, everything that happens at the national level has has begun at the grassroots level. So I think the grassroots efforts are terribly important. And uh, I, I don't want Sarah Brady to hear me say this, but I wish you'd give your money to Oregonians Against Gun Violence. <laughs> Corlene Kraft, member. You both mentioned that uh, the support of, the pres of President Reagan and Lessa Coyne seemed to have had some impact on the passage of the Brady Bill, and there seems to be an emotional um, resolve that's rising in the country. What effect is that having currently on the power that the NRA has been wielding for so long? Oh, the NRA. Um, <laughs> conventional wisdom has it that we should not demonize the enemy, but, but I, I, I'm in favor of demonizing the NRA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, because I think what, what Chief Potter was saying is, is very true about gun manufacturers in this country have gotten off scot-free, and it is they who are the, the real engine to the National Rifle Association. The good news is that the National Rifle Association is in a little bit of, of difficult straits. They're losing membership. They've gone from 3.2 to 2.6 million members in five years. They're suffering from internal factionalism. They're suffering from a bad public image problem right now. They're, they're, they're the perception of the NRA is changing, which I'm really glad to see. And they've lost all kinds of battles across the country, legislative battles, um, court battles, and, and election battles as well. The, the, the difficulty is, and it's a good thing you're all sitting down, because their national budget is $90 million annually, 90 millions of dollars they have to spend, so they are still a formidable opponent. It is to be hoped that they will outfox themselves as they did in the House of Representatives in, in Washington. They lobbied too hard, and what I heard when I was back there was that people got mad and said, uh, Representative said, you know, I don't even care about this issue. I'm just tired of getting pushed around. I'm going to vote yes on Brady just because I'm tired of getting pushed around. 
The other point to make about the National Rifle Association, I'd just like to take this opportunity to do this, is that I think it's important to distinguish between the national lobby and local gun groups, because they often have very different motivations and very different agendas. And I'm certainly not willing to demonize local gun groups, because I think we can work together. And I have seen local gun affiliate, lo local gun group leaders part company with, with people from the National Rifle Association, so it's, it's important to to remember that distinction. Well, I guess it sort of proves my point about economics is that $90 million just doesn't buy you what it used to. <laughs> <laughs> well said. But um, I, I don't uh, demonize NRA because I know people who belong to the NRA and members of our Portland Police Bureau, and I consider them fine people. Um, I think they're human beings. No one is ever one-dimensional and that they have other facets to them that I think make them worthwhile as human beings. I think it's this issue where we part ways, and it's okay in a diverse society to have different points of view. Oh, hey, me too. And can I say that when I... <laughs> <laughs> When I said I wanted to demonize the NRA, I was talking about the leadership in Washington, okay? I'm not talking about individual members. I no. certainly am not talking about individual members, because I, too, have friends in the NRA. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Bill Weber, member. Uh, this is a rather small item and uh, directed at Chief Potter, and perhaps you can comfort me and my concern. And that is, uh, we read about uh, cars when they're confiscated because of violations of the law being sold. What about guns? Uh, with police uh, <coughs> organizations all over the country, are, when they're confiscated, are they confiscated forever? Or are they sold in a different market outside the state or outside the country? Uh, what happens to them? And should that be something to look into? Granted, the quantities may be small, but yet it'd be symbolic in our attitudes as citizens as to what really happens to those things that are confiscated. We do not confiscate and resale firearms. We do, however, use some of those firearms for training purposes for police only. The rest uh, are physically destroyed. Is that uh, typical of uh, police organizations? all over Oregon and all over the country? Um, I think it is, sir. Uh, it would be very foolish of us to seize them just to put them back out in the market again. Thank you. I have another question that was handed up in written form from the floor for Chief Potter. Has a satisfactory definition been developed that will separate assault weapons from semi-automatic sporting guns? <laughs> so glad this question was asked of Chief Potter. <laughs> I'll be leaving now. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, I don't have the foggiest idea. Uh, I do know that there are weapons that are designed specifically to kill human beings. Those are manufactured by um, military manufacturers, and that um, we have a number of examples of those in our own fair city. Um, many of the uh, automatic weapons produced by the U.S. military, the AR-15s, AR-16s. Um, Israel uh, manufactures uh, also small portable machine guns, but those are specifically designed for the taking of human life. Um, I don't, I'm unfamiliar with the phrase an automatic sporting gun. <laughs> I, I can't imagine, uh, you know, those poor defenseless animals don't stand a chance anyway, <laughs> why you would want to try to machine gun them down. But. Or, or try to eat the remains. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon Padgett, member. How do you, res do you respond to critics of gun control legislation who say that the Second Amendment does give them the right to bear arms? The Second Amendment consists of two halves, the first half and the second half. No, it consists of two halves. The first half says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma. That's the first half. The second half says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It is important to remember that first half because it tells the story of that amendment and it reveals the original intent 
That is, it was a question of military matters and not a question of, of individual ownership and, and possession of, of firearms. More importantly, we need to remember that in the entire history of the, this country, the Supreme Court has never overturned a law based on a challenge to the Second Amendment and in fact has delivered, in language, in, in opinions handed down, it has stated the Second Amendment does not deal with, with the independent ability, uh, right to bear arms. It, it pertains to military matters. So I have heard it said that this is probably the best settled proposition in constitutional law, and I know that it will continue to be discussed, but um, you know, the Supreme Court refused to review uh, an NRA challenge of the 1986 federal law banning ownership of machine guns made after 1986, and uh, the Supreme Court wouldn't even wouldn't even review the lower court decision uh, denying the NRA case. So apparently, it's it's pretty well settled in, in terms of court interpretation. I think that the Constitution, the other laws of our country, try to balance out rights and responsibilities. I think for the last um, quarter of a century we've been tied up in rights, but a lot of us forgot what our responsibilities are. And so for me, um, when I look at that, I try to balance those two things. I wonder what would happen, or how it would be like today if automobiles had been invented around the time the Constitution was written. What kind of sacred right do we have to possess an automobile? And yet, the automobile does much damage but we also restrict and license and require certain things to occur before people use an automobile. So today, I guess, the discussion is gun control. If it had been written a few hundred years later, it could have been car control. We have time for a final question. Uh, my name is Jonathan Ross. I've been a member from, since way back around the, the beginning of lunch today. Uh, <laughs> and my question is for Dana. Now that you've become an old political hand and that you, you know the ropes, do you have any personal political ambitions or are you just going to write a book putting all the tips that you've gathered together <laughs> for the rest of us? Thank you for that question. How come nobody ever asked me if I want to play small forward for the Blazers? That's my, <laughs> my real ambition. <laughs> I, I would not ever rule that out, except I would need to be convinced quite seriously that, that one could do more as a politician than as an advocate. I, I just, I, I don't know that question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. Since that was a short question, we'll take one really final question. Yeah. There's time for, uh, <coughs> going back to the, uh, my name is Randall Kester, member. <coughs> going back to the question asked of Chief Potter about assault weapons, I think it was perhaps misunderstood. The question was not <coughs> automatic, but semi-automatic sporting, <coughs> sporting goods. And uh, a three-shot shotgun, uh, automa semi-automatic, uh, would be uh, in very common use. And I just wondered if, if the chief had that in mind when he said that a <coughs> game animal or bird wouldn't have any chance against an automatic weapon. Well, I certainly stand corrected, but I'm sure the animal doesn't feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> the question was whether there was a satisfactory way to separate a semi-automatic sporting gun. I, I don't have the technical information or background uh, to uh, provide the answer to that. I'm sorry. With that, we, uh, we want to thank once again Chief Tom Potter and Dana Schaefer for a very interesting and informative presentation, and we are adjourned.